Doctor Strange was, he was a jerk. He's not a likable person. Nobody's just that big of an ass just because they're an ass. There's a reason behind it, and we explore that. Of all the films that we've done, this is the biggest transformation of a character emotionally. He needed a car accident, take away the use of his hands in order to really find out you know, what he's made out of. He is one of those guys who in the past, whenever he comes into a series, completely turns it upside down because he's such, a, he's such an odd and mysterious and unique character in the world of Marvel. The master of the mystic art. Doctor Strange is probably my favorite Marvel character. I had done a story with Steve Ditko, who I had done the um, amazing adult fantasies with, about a magician, I think it was called Dr. Droom or Dr. I can't remember. But when I was looking for something to do with Steve, I said, let's do a magician. And I think he reminded me we had done something like it. Or maybe he said to me, let's do a magician. But at any rate, we got together and decided to do Dr. Strange and Steve was in his element. I had to think when I saw his artwork, I had to think that this guy is from another dimension. I mean, nobody could have drawn the stuff he drew the way he drew it. Just the way people are still riffing on Kirby's, people are still, you know, 90% of the other dimensions in comic books <laughs> come from, from Ditko's Doctor Strange and the things that he created on the page that had never been seen before. I, I love the Stan Lee, Steve Ditko stuff. First, Stan Lee, always good, always did the characters. Ditko was always the weird guy in the corner sort of artist. The rest of the artists working at Marvel, starting with Jack Kirby, who did the Fantastic Four and is you know very well known, it was all very clean, straightforward, upright, superhero stuff. Whereas Steve had a style, as Jack did, but Steve had a style all his own. You couldn't mistake it. The visuals that Ditko did for the magical realms are still what everybody goes to when they want to do Doctor Strange. He had very distinctive ways of drawing things, coming out of things and curling through things and all this stuff that just made you feel like you were in some sort of alternate reality. Now this is the 60s when they started this. You could look at it now when we have CGI and everything and go, oh, well, you know, but it was very bizarre for its time and it really set up something that remained very distinct throughout its entire run. You know, to think that Lee and Ditko, you know, that they were working with this idea in the early 60s is amazing to me. And suddenly this man, who was in Strange's case, here's a guy who literally, you know, went to India, found his guru and was transformed by it. Now, it being comic books, you know, he also has to learn to have spells and shoot bolts at people, but what was wonderful again, you know, that, that all these stories become metaphors. You get, you get to write about the spiritual reality and, and in, in a way that it's concrete to the audience. And yet uh, the, the metaphysical underpinnings are all still there. You know, and as the character evolved and the next generation of writers came in and started exploring it, and those of us that had been on our own spiritual search in those years, began to bring that even more to this beautiful framework that Lee and Ditko had created. As you know, I love language and I love the sound of words. So somehow when I needed a villain, I couldn't call him uh, the evil Dr. Bad or something, but I thought of the name Dormammu. I mean, that's gotta send shivers up your spine. And then a little adjective in front of it, the dread Dormammu. Oh man, I wouldn't go into a room if I thought there was somebody with that name waiting inside. And more than that, though, you know, Dr. Strange was a magician. Well, when he was going to do his tricks, I couldn't have him just say, hocus pocus, let something happen. Or, you know, that, so I tried to make up incantations that sounded like they meant something, like, if I can remember them, by the hoary hosts of Hoggoth, or let's see, by the shades of the, of the shadowy seraphim, whatever the hell that means or by the something of the Sidorak. I, 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 anything that sounded mysterious to me. I took over Doctor Strange in 1973, still fairly early in my career, but I'd done a couple books by that point. And Doctor Strange was a book which was always kind of on the edge as to whether it would work or not work because it's an odd concept. It had been on hiatus for a couple of years before that. They had brought it back, given it to another writer, but they weren't happy with what he was doing. 
So then they said, you, you know, <laughs> you give it a shot. These are comics that I wrote. These are the ones that I did with Frank Brunner, the first artist that I had. Frank, as I say, had a very distinctive style, beautiful comic book cover. This is another story from that issue where Strange is falling into the realm of death, as you can see. And you can contrast that with Gene Colan's art. Colan, as I said, was more realistic, but not too realistic. It was sort of, he could draw fantasy realistically. This is Strange sort of succumbing to a number of demons. This is Strange with Dracula. This was a one-shot crossover we did with the Dracula comic where um, at the end of my story, I killed Dracula, and at the end of the Dracula story, the writer over there killed Strange. Just a little friendly work between the writers. I like Doctor Strange a lot it, because I've done lots and lots and lots of superheroes, and I like superheroes. I mean, they're the bulwark of comics, and I like comics. But it's interesting to find guys who are not on the beaten track, and Doctor Strange as the only real magician in the world. I mean, there are other magicians, but he's the top of the peak of a very small peak. He was very interesting to play with, and, and I could find a lot of things to do with him that I couldn't do with other people. And, and so every issue was a real adventure doing Doctor Strange. Much like the first three films, we were looking to do something different with Doctor Strange, and really to do something overall different with the fourth movie. You know, we try to find a certain, certain rhythm, a certain artistic flair for each show that, that we do here at Marvel, MLG. And Doctor Strange really, we, we, we utilize quite a few different elements. You know, I mean, Steve Ditko is a huge influence for that matter, so is uh, Gene Cullen. It was another big Doctor Strange artist. Frank Bruner, definitely. You, you want to do each of their certain styles, but you can't. So you have to come up with something that tries to carry the, you know, carries the flavor, the essence of it. You know, what they were trying to do. I looked at almost all of them. Uh, all of the Doctor Strange books, I, I read as many as I could. You know, the origin is interesting, all by itself. A guy whose entire life is in his hands as the surgeon, losing him and then bottoming out. If you look at that origin story, we got three panels, three, maybe four panels telling, you know, he's Dr. Strange, loses the use of his hands, and he's in Tibet. Uh, I mean, with it, there's a whole movie there, you know, that, that we had to fill out. We basically added a lot more to impact to it because we learned a lot more about why Stephen Strange was the person that he was before he became the Sorcerer Supreme. Finding his destiny in, the in a tiny monastery up in Tibet, you know, I, that's just great stuff. And once he gets there, that's really where, okay, now what? Now what are you gonna do with the story? What's the overall threat that you need to establish that he is actually uniquely qualified to deal with because of what he's gone through? We not only explore that story, we come to sympathize, even empathize a little bit with Stephen Strange, what made him the person he is, and ultimately the person that he becomes within this film. It's a nice, intimate story about one man's journey that will connect with the audience, uh, both old fans and people who have no idea who Doctor Strange is. We've loaded all sorts of little goodies within a lot of the design elements for people to sift over and try to make some kind of meaning now. No, I can't say any more than that, but definitely they will enjoy all the little uh, bits and pieces that we put in there. The challenges to creating something that was based in sorcery and magic is establishing a set of rules so that a character just doesn't start pulling abilities out of thin air when you need them to. I'm sorry, Mordo. I didn't mean to. Because if anyone and everyone can do everything, it doesn't allow you any boundaries to create exciting action. Or, or, or really much of a story at all. You, you have to have limita limitations. Now, of course, you want to come up with something different for each character so that they're not all just doing things with their hands um, so that they're visually unique. Some may, may use fabric or scarves. Some may use sand. Some may use air or water or what have you. But there's an element that they have to hold on to that they're allowed to channel their gifts through. And once you can get to that point, they're really no different than regular superheroes or mutants, you know, in the X-Men world. They can accomplish certain things. They have a specialty. That's what they use. 
but just the basis of it is not in science necessarily, but in mysticism. The Sorcerer Supreme is someone who is not bound to any one element or one thing, but can control all forms of energy. That's why they're the absolute power. So for us, by giving that structure, that allowed us to tell a story that's believable and made sense. I can't just say some word and stop you. I have to have resources that allow me to do what I, to do my magic. Magic is a really wondrous, colorful thing. You know, it's a different, it's a different world in and of itself. So how we use color in the film, when we first see the monastery, when we first see Dormammu's dread dimension, and we see people using magic, it all has a very colorful effect. And a character like Dormammu, he's amazing because he is a being of absolute magic. You know, he transformed out of his physical form and became pure magic, really, uh, is amazing because it allows you a character that really has unlimited power and a, a nasty grudge against humanity and the Ancient One. He's one of the pieces of Doctor Strange's story that we knew the fans would be looking to see. And I think his translation and the creatures that he controls, who all have markings that speak to their master, uh, are some of the most spectacular aspects of this film. <laughs> These things are basically consuming some of these sorcerers. I mean, you know, the life and death stakes here are real for these characters. You don't get to do that in television, of course, in, in uh, Saturday morning television. But in these movies, yeah, there's, you establish the stakes, people can die. It's a lot more tense when you're watching a scene like that, knowing that some, not all of them are gonna come out of it. You have creatures that are from worlds that Dormammu has consumed in his quest for more power and more magic that are being unleashed on Earth that only these sorcerers can stop. But they're at a crossroads. This war is about to come down between them and this being of absolute magic. And if they don't get it together, there's no saving our world. What I think is important in these kind of movies is it's the character growth. You can get very trapped into the spectacle of, a, of an action superhero kind of, kind of movie. But you know what? The main character needs to impact the plot. Things happen because of what the main character does, not the plot carrying the main character along. He has to make decisions that changes the course of the story. And I think when you can map out that kind of a structure for a movie, it's a lot more engaging. You're seeing that he's not just being swept along in the, in the tide. His decisions and choices are what's dictating the course of the movie. What happened to the wall? You perceived it, so it was there. But now you have accepted the unacceptable. You know, I've said it probably a hundred times. This, these projects began for the fans who read our books. You know, those are the people who before films, before animated series, before live, live action, were always there to champion us. In our darkest times, they still picked up the comics. We look in every way we can to constantly speak to them in these moments. We never want to leave anyone out. We want anyone who sits on the couch with you who may not know these characters or know these worlds can, can sit down and get into it and fall in love with them as fast as you do when you picked up your first comic. So the little nods that go over the heads of those newbies were, weren't there for them anyways. Well, maybe they'll go back to the book someday or the fan on the couch will tell them what it is. If not, that's for them and them alone. So whenever we can put those things in there, that's, uh, that's something we love to do. Because again, everyone on the film, Greg, Frank, uh, uh, everybody, we're, we're all fans of this world. This is the fifth film in the, uh, in the franchise of what we're calling Marvel's animated features. Part of the promise we made to the fans was we're going to keep delivering things they're not expecting. Working with Lionsgate, we have a unique opportunity here where we can take risks that we haven't done in the past. The big thing we're trying to achieve here is to come up with something that helps to broaden the audience. The characters are brand new for this film. They were created for this. They're not based on any uh, existing comic book. It's kind of tongue-in-cheek going off the Ultimates, even though we're gonna show Avengers in more of their classical costumes in the beginning. The depth of characters and the scope of characters that our fan base you know, has learned to expect from these films. Incredible Hulk, Iron Man, this one will feature Ultron. 
the characters have grown older, uh, so has Bruce Banner. Here you've got this Hulk with a receding hairline, but he's got hair down to his shoulders and a little goatee, and in some ways it makes him look a little more savage. And we want those big characters, those huge action sequences and fights and battles, which the script is filled with. And it takes place, you know, several decades into the future. This is a story of the children of the Avengers. So Avengers Reborn. The goal was to make something accessible to new viewers and, you know, to have kids as the protagonists. This movie is written a little bit younger. Our new group of kids, uh, which have been created, you know, beautifully for this film, bring a whole new generation of fans into this. This is about telling stories that are going to entertain the adults, the teenagers, and hopefully be done in such a way that some of the younger kids can stay and watch alongside the, uh, the older fans. I would describe it as just like incredibly energetic, young, and fun. It's really like a melding of the two worlds. I mean, not only is it new characters, but they're living in a universe that, you know, the fans will know of and be very, very familiar with. It kind of brings to conclusion what happened to the Avengers. We've seen the Avengers in the first movie kind of come about. This one starts with their demise. They're coming out of retirement to have to fight a, a nemesis larger than any that they've ever known before. It's this beautiful, tragic story where Tony is forced to leave the battlefield and gather the children and usher them away to safety before Ultron cuts his way through the parents to the last that remains of, of the Age of Heroes. And imagine if you're one of these kids, you've heard the glory stories of your parents. My father's a well-known father, how do I live up to that? So now it's not only that, it's my father, who's a well-known superhero, could not defeat him. Who am I? We want to keep the audience guessing. We want you to be able to see one frame of it on television and say, oh my God, you know, that's a Marvel film but it's not one I've seen yet. It's something completely different. As the story goes through, we actually follow these kids, and it's kind of a coming of age thing. Uh, it's a heavy story, so we try to keep it light as we could, but still not take away the, the weight of what these kids are bearing. They lost their parents, they lose their world, they're sucked away to this new place where it's completely unfamiliar. What happens over time is the playboy has become the father. Now these kids are his responsibility, and he fell in love with them. But all the love in the world and all the great technology that Tony still had couldn't protect them from the destinies that is going to collide with them in this story. And all through this is kind of a running theme through these kids' lives that we, we expose their weaknesses. It's out there for you to see, but it feeds perfectly into their strength and the way they overcome. Gary came into this project with a vision. We talked about the story, but he already knew the kind of the, the, the palette, the bone structure, the look, the feel. He knew what he wanted to do. We didn't really have a script finished yet. So the writer comes in and meets with Gary and Craig and myself and the creative team and talk through the visual development of the story. With this project, they actually brought me in and showed me like, you know, concept designs and character designs. And what it's helping us to do is to take some of the onus off the writer to create the visual development. I think it really just, you know, made the script stronger, having that kind of visual base to it. And allows the writer to work more on dialogue and story structure, leaving the creative development of the environments, the uh, mechanics of weapons and vehicles, the clothing of the characters, leaving a lot more of that to the animation team. The great thing about Avengers Reborn is that it's just like a fun adventure. I mean, it's, it's really a roller coaster ride, and once it gets going, which is pretty quick, it doesn't stop. It's always that fine line. We're going to reinvent the characters once again, as they have been a hundred times before, without losing what people expect to see when they see an Iron Man or a Tony Stark on screen or an Ultron. We want to bring in a younger fan base. And also, you know, we want to keep, you know, the comic book fans that love this kind of stuff. What's going to keep it fresh? What's going to speak to the world of these kids and this specific story? Without losing sight of Marvel Comics, Marvel characters, and what we, uh, what we promise to bring. Challenging ourselves to continually raise the bar and bring something new to the table on each film. I have all the confidence in the world that we're doing that.
acute aphasia, migraines, facial nerve paralysis. People want to strangle you, Stephen. I can't believe it. What? Doctor Strange. Who's there? I am Wong. <gasps> Wait. divide into two teams. This gets more difficult every day. <laughs> 